The European Union um, was planned long before the, the name was even mentioned, uh, long before even the European Economic Community was mentioned. It goes way back. It involves um, the House of Rothschild, of course, if anything is happening of serious manipulation and conspiracy, um, then the House of Rothschild will be in there at operational level. And one of the uh, other so-called elite families is the, uh, the Habsburgs. And uh, of course, Otto von Habsburg has been involved in the uh, manipulation of the European Union as is now for long before, like I say, it was ever mentioned. The idea is very simple. If you are the few and you want to control the many, you have to centralize decision making, you have to centralize power. The more points of decision making you have, the more diversity of decision making, the less power any small cabal is going to have at the center. So the idea has been over not just hundreds of years, but thousands of years to incessantly centralize uh, power, to centralize decision making. If you think uh, back a little way, um, humanity was assembled, if you like, in tribes where there were lots of tribes in these different areas of land and the tribes were making decisions over what happened in the tribe. Then came the first major, major centralization uh, operation and that was when they turned large numbers of these tribes into different nations. And of course then you've got a situation where now a few people at the center of the nation are dictating to all the previous tribes. <clears throat> what the European Union is and of course they have uh, plans for similar um, structures all over the world, like they've got the African Union, they want the North American Union to be the American Union, they want the Asia Pacific Union, but the European Union is the blueprint. And this was the next stage where they started bringing the nations together under centralized control. So now a few literal bureaucrats in Brussels are dictating to the nations of Europe the next stage from that is a world government um, which would dictate to the, the unions. And um, so as with all of these manipulations of society, you see the outcome at some point, like now we've got this Lisbon Treaty and you know, uh, in effect a United States of Europe, but that's the outcome as it is at the moment. Actually, it started decades and decades and decades ago, way back in the early part of the 20th century, when all this thing was kind of orchestrated. And one of the, of course, major frontmen of the creation of the European community was Jean Monnet, who was just, uh, an, again, a frontman for these families, who was used as the, the orchestrator and um, the administrator uh, into existence of this um, European economic community as it was. And, and he wrote to a friend, um, in the year I was born, we're talking nearly 60 years ago, 57 years ago, um, and he was saying that the idea is not to tell anybody basically that this, what we want is a centralized super state in effect, but what we'll do is we'll keep incessantly moving towards that and give an economic excuse for why the different stages of more and more centralization are justified until, as you put it, you basically pass a point where there's no return. And uh, in effect, barring a, a, a colossal revolution, um, we're, we are in the present state of things anyway, past the point of no return. And it's just been a, a, a classic, classic case of what I call the totalitarian tiptoe, where you start at A, you know you're going to Z, but you know if you go in gigantic leaps, then the change is so dramatic and quick that people look up and ask what's going on. So you make your, your leaps as much as you can get away with, but not so far that there's a big kind of reaction and acknowledgement that something very different is going on here. And uh, they've, they, they've done it um, brilliantly. But the way they played it in more recent times is to deny the public an opportunity to have a decision or make a decision in referendums, etc., on the incessant centralization of power that we've been seeing. 
because more and more people are beginning, in fact, well past beginning, um, to to look at the European Union the way it's going and, and, and feel great unease about it. We saw this with the no votes for the constitution in, in the Netherlands and in France, and that was a big wake-up call to the manipulators um, because they realized that if you give people the opportunity to say yes or no to this creation of this United States of Europe, then overwhelmingly you're going to get a no. That is why they simply changed the um, name of the constitution to the treaty and kept 98% or something of the constitution in the treaty. It was an excuse, clearly, blatantly, obviously, not to have a rerun of the French and Dutch referendums because they knew they, they would say no again and not to have to give a referendum in the UK where we would have massively said no, no question. The arrogance and the, um, the, the agenda of this cabal is such that public opinion is totally and utterly irrelevant. And if public opinion is going to say what you don't want it to say, then you do not give public opinion the chance to say it. In Ireland, of course, thanks to the Irish constitution, they had to have a referendum on this treaty. And the Irish said no. What happens then is we can't call it something else, so we've got to get the Irish to turn over that decision. Now, you see, in a normal course of events, you have a referendum. The referendum decides, and everyone gets on with their lives. And if that referendum, that first one in Ireland, had have said yes to the treaty, that is exactly what would have happened. But the, as I've said many times over the years, if it's the agenda, it doesn't take no for an answer. And so you know when it's the agenda because it will not accept the outcome of a public referendum. So we have the second one. What happens then is they go to town big time on all the areas they need to change to get a different vote. One of the things that happened in Ireland, outrageously, was the people that decide uh, media policy and media balance policy and media uh, bias policy in Ireland decided that in the second referendum, um, the television stations and the media didn't have to give equal time to the yes or no vote. They just had to give basically equal time to each party. And as only one party, Sinn Féin, was uh, uh, wanting to vote no, of course, the massive yes vote got, uh, uh, arena rather, got um, all the coverage. And um, to be honest, uh, if that vote had not been genuinely no, and some people think it wasn't, then they would have made it so by manipulating the, the, the votes anyway and manipulating the count and, and because these people will not take no for an answer. So what we now have is a situation outrageously where a, a group of unelected bureaucrats in Brussels appointed by other bureaucrats controlled by the elite family network are now going to decide um, on the policy and the structure of European society. And for those Irish people who genuinely voted yes to it, and those young people I saw jumping up and down with joy, like a goal had been scored in a cup final when the vote came through yes. If you ever watch this, you people that did that, you are going to regret what you did for the rest of your life. Because what's going to happen now, and we're already seeing it, Henrik, is once this power is secured, only to, we've only got the Czech Republic now to go through it, etc. 
we are going to see the speed of European central control just be unleashed. There's, there, there, this European control system, as we speak, is like a series of 100-meter runners at the start of an Olympic 100-meter final. It's like, on your marks, get set, and now they're waiting. And as soon as this, this control system is through and this treaty is all um, intact, the gun's going to go off. And in all directions, massive centralization of power, dictatorship from the center is going to happen. We're going to see things like a European database where all the countries pull their database. We're going to see European laws, European law enforcement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you people in Ireland, good on you who voted no, but you voted yes. Young people... I'm afraid the celebrations are going to be very short. Because you know what the Irish have done, those that voted yes? They've voted to never have the option of voting again. Because what this means is, from now on, with the, 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 the changes in the structure, we have literally a European government that has almost total power. And when you think that even now, before the treaty comes in, something like 75% of laws in the UK originate in the European Union, well, what's going to happen now? And um, it's, uh, it's been coming a long time, and some people have seen it, and some people have been watching the soap and the sports. Speaking about law, um, the, uh, the, the law text of the European Union, or the body of the law, um, acquis communitaire or whatever is the French term, probably butchering that, but anyway, it contains about 80,000 pages of, of law according to some sources. Then this uh, UK think tank, uh, which is critical of the European Union called Open Europe, recently did a check on this and claimed that it actually is 170,000 pages long, the, the body of the law in, in the European Union. Uh, so with that, having said that, uh, the New World Order pretty much is potentially not the crackdown that we first might have thought it was uh, with you know tear gas and tasers, batons, rubber bullets, what have you, uh, advanced technology, so-called non-lethal weapons and so forth. Uh, okay, that happens now and again, like in Pittsburgh, but generally it seems like the New World Order is more about rules, uh, regulations, bylaws, do's and don'ts, uh, ink and paper, and in a way, in the future, panopticon, if you will, uh, even to make a move or to um, be able to do something, you have to file a motion or, or uh, turn in a paper or something like that. And that seems to be uh, what is happening right now. We're being entangled in, in this web of laws, pretty much. Maybe you can comment on well, that. Well, the web of laws is a very good uh, uh, term because um, I have a, an image that uh, an artist friend of mine, Neil Haig, uh, knocked out for me in produced for me, which I use in my talks, which is of um, a spider's web with the spider um, entangling human beings in the web. And it's a very good analogy because what you're looking at is in all areas of human activity, there, the, the do's and don'ts are coming closer and closer, becoming more and more fine detail. And the point, the point is to, to tie you, tangle you to the web like a fly to the web so you can't move. And, and of course, ludicrously detailed bureaucracy is part of that. Um, I spoke in uh, Croatia a couple of times um, in the last couple of years who are in the process of um, negotiating entry to the European Union. And I, 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 w I was saying there um, that it's like, it's like um, tanks and, and, uh, and, and